So tonight we're going to start at the beginning. <laughs> Some, sometimes we don't. Sometimes okay. you'll remember a few of them where we started in the middle. Start, but, at, start at the end and work backwards. <laughs> or something. Yeah, yeah. Well, you can yeah. if you're a good storyteller. Yeah. People can do that. But um, no, you were born in yeah. Ontario. Born Tell in us Ontario, a little bit about 1950, that. small town, Belleville, Ontario. Um, my parents were uh, met during the war. My mother was a, a war bride. She was from Wales and was in the uh, Women's Air Force. And my dad was a French Canadian. Uh, in the Canadian Air Force overseas. So they met in uh, Britain and uh, got married during the war and we always tease my dad. He uh, was a terrible decision maker. He couldn't make decisions, but he proposed to my mom in three months. So we used to always say, you know, <laughs> how did that happen? And he just said, during the war, you lost track of people and he was not going to lose track of her. So he, uh, he tied her down and she said, well, I'll tell you in three months, yay or nay, and she said yes. So. Yeah. Good, and there, here we are. Yeah. Here you are. Yeah. Yeah, good. Uh, and, uh, yeah. Okay, so continue. We'll continue, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so um, tell us about Girl Guides growing up. So uh, Chick had asked me where I got my interest in the, uh, the outdoors and, and nature. My parents were outdoorsy, but we didn't uh, go camping. We went on, on hikes. Um, but I was really involved in Girl Guides, and uh, the guide leader I had was really into camping, and I was really got really into camping, and uh, went to a national camp in uh, BC, and then in 1967 went to an international camp in Sweden, and that was actually a Girl Guide and Boy Scout camp, which we didn't have in Canada, so that was quite interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I was 16 that year, so that was I was perfect. <laughs> That's quite perfect. The yep. Sweet 16. Yeah, yep, exactly. Yeah. Um, then, uh, education wise, I went to uh, University of Guelph. I was interested in, um, well, both the sciences and art, and there weren't that many programs that combined it. So I uh, found this program at University of Guelph. It was called Family and Consumer Studies, and it was actually an old, uh, it had previous been, previously been a home ec program. And I uh, chose the stream, which was called Clothing, Textiles, and Design. And what really attracted me, we did the design stuff, but we also did the, uh, the chemistry of the, the fibers and the fire retardants and all that sort of stuff. So I really enjoyed that. It's falling off. Uh, yeah. Is that working? I think so. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> So after uh, graduating from University of Guelph, a Bachelor of Applied Science, um, I actually didn't really want to go and work. I was having too much fun being a student. And uh, I sort of had had this image of uh, you know, being a fashion designer or a fabric designer. And uh, just knew I didn't have the personality to, like you really have to sell yourself and sell your product. And that wasn't me, so I thought, OK, that's going to be a hobby, so I looked at what else I could do, and I got into um, a planning program at the University of Waterloo, which was a, a master's degree in planning, and that was sort of uh, very early on in the whole planning programs. Uh, so I took, uh, I got a master's degree in uh, regional planning, and got particularly interested both in environmental planning, but in uh, public consultation, and just how to uh, engage and involve people in decision-making, land use uh, decisions. So my first job was with uh, actually the guy who was a professor at the university. Um, uh, he ran a consulting company that ran uh, public consultation programs. And I, I worked for him for two years, and we had uh, contracts with uh, Canadian Penitentiary Service, uh, trying to convince communities to have a maximum security uh, prison in their community. <laughs> Uh, in, and that they wanted to have a maximum security prison in the Toronto-based area because that's where most of their clients came from. And <laughs> the, uh, but the, the prisons were mainly in the Kingston, historically in, in the Kingston area. And actually, a prison isn't a bad thing to have in your community, particularly maximum security, good employment, et cetera, et cetera. Um, also worked with, we had a contract with the... Um, Ontario Hydro, we were uh, trying to, to help them locate their 500 kilovolt system throughout uh, Ontario transmission 
system. So dealing a lot with uh, farm groups and women's institutes. And I found that really if you wanted to get the reaction of the farming community, you talked to the women. So I, I got really involved in the women's institutes and, and went to, uh, to their meetings to try and see what their views were. Uh, and also, uh, at that point, uh, Ontario Hydro was trying to locate uh, a nuclear generating station in the Ottawa Valley, which is a valley that has some tectonic movement. So that didn't go that far. It didn't actually. happen. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. No. Yeah. And uh, disposal of the uh, radioactive material on a site near Lake Ontario didn't go very far either. So <laughs> then... No. Uh, the last contract I worked on was with the uh, Ontario uh, Ministry of Natural Resources that has the, um, they have the regulations regarding gravel pits and, and uh, extraction of gravel. And they were trying to locate some major gravel pits, again, in the sort of greater Toronto region. So I was at a, a public meeting talking about gravel pits, and this man stood up and said, I remember you. You're the one that buddies with the convicts. Well, I know how you can fill your gravel pits. <laughs> so uh, th that's sort of when I thought, you know, I don't know that I really like this job <laughs> anymore. No. <laughs> so, <laughs> no. Uh, we're, we're missing one story, though, where you fell one? in love with the mountains. The summer of the oh, blazing... Oh, the summer between, yes, uh, The okay. summer of the blazing romance. My blazing summer romance, yeah. <laughs> so the uh, summer between... Um, the University of Guelph undergraduate program and uh, going to University of Waterloo. I got a job at uh, Emerald Lake and that was when you know you came out on the train and you worked at one of these places. So I worked at Emerald Lake uh, at the front desk and at the gift shop. And uh, the lodge was owned by uh, Bill and Barb Smythe at the time. And um, yes, I had what we called a BSR, a blazing summer romance. <laughs> with this uh, wonderful guy that really liked to hike and had a vehicle. So, <laughs> so uh, they would arrange your shifts so you could get off early on your, the, before your weekend and came back in the late shift so uh, you could do some significant hiking. And we hiked all over the place. And I, I absolutely loved it. Got to know Yoho very well, being at, at Emerald Lake, but got to go up to Lake O'Hara and camp on the meadow when you could do that and uh, just thoroughly uh, like the hiking. And I, and I just remembered, I, I went uh, to MEC in Calgary and bought real hiking boots and I paid $65 for them. Mm -hmm. It was just astounding, that much money on a pair of boots, but they were necessary. Yeah. Yeah. So that was my, my intro yeah. to the mountains. Yeah. mountains. Yeah. And then you got into uh, uh, um, parks. You. Yeah. Are we up to parks yet? Okay, I think we're up to parks, yeah. yeah. So my blazing summer romance after I went back to Ontario, that sort of petered out, but I was still keen on parks and still keen on, uh, on mountains. So uh, after working for, um, the, I worked for the Ontario uh, government in their uh, food and agriculture branch for a while, uh, I got a job with Parks Canada in their Cornwall office. So it was the, had originally been the office for uh, Quebec and Ontario, and by then was the office for Ontario. So I got a planning position there, and I worked on a um, plan for Point Pelee uh, National Park, and I worked on a lot of uh, national historic sites too, because there were quite a few in Ontario, and particularly worked on the sites that were in the uh, Niagara Peninsula and the uh, Niagara on the Lake area, which were um, a lot of buildings associated with the War of 1812. So um, that was interesting, working on the community with the community and various uh, interest groups in terms of trying to restore and maintain uh, those facilities. Um, and uh -huh. I had um, my Wayne Cornwall, my husband uh, Miles Cullum was also a planner, and um, he couldn't get a planning job in Ontario. It's not exactly a big place for uh, planners. So in um, 1981, we moved to Alberta. So I was able to relocate to the Calgary Regional Office for Parts Canada uh, in a planning position there. And uh, Miles got about six job offers in six weeks when he got here because Calgary was just booming. So the whole thing worked out well for us. 
Okay, so you yeah. moved to Calgary. So I came to Calgary. Uh, Miles got a good job. Um, and I worked on the Four Mountain Park planning program. So uh, it was a program that was already underway to try and develop one sort of overarching plan for the four contiguous parks, so Banff and Jasper, Kootenai and Yoho. And I worked on uh, Jasper and Yoho, and Ron Hooper was there working on the, the Banff and Kootenai plans. So uh, got out in, in the, uh, the parks a lot, particularly Jasper, went up to uh, Jasper about every uh, third week to, to work on things. And uh, I remember one day going to the, uh, the budget rental place in, in Calgary to rent a car to go up to Jasper. And sort of standing at the counter and sort of sighing and rolling my eyes because I had to drive to Jasper again. And this young woman behind the counter said, I've grown up in Calgary, I've never been to Jasper. And I just thought, you know, <laughs> to whine about having to go to Jasper was, I had to stop it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And in Calgary, we um, got really involved again in backpacking. I introduced Miles to uh, backpacking. We basically, uh, we were out every weekend we could. We would uh, promise ourselves we're going to commit our weekends. We'll, we'll sit down and do that before the May long weekend so that every weekend is planned. Because if you don't, you know, you're going to get invited to the barbecue and do this and do that and you're not going to get out. And then we took our, uh, our holidays and we divided them up. So we made every weekend into a three-day weekend so we could go on a two-day, you know, two-night overnight uh, backpack. So I, you know, I really took advantage of, yeah. of being in Calgary and being near the mountains. Right. And then you got that, took that Job little turn north, of, yeah. of, of to yeah. Baker Lake. Yeah. So I, in uh, 82... Um, I had a really interesting experience going uh, north to Baker Lake, which was at that time in the Northwest Territories. It's now part of Nunavut. And um, they were looking for uh, somebody that knew something about the sort of tourism value of, of historic sites. And the territorial was gov government was wondering if a place like Baker Lake could be used as a tourism draw to get people there. And... Um, they had uh, historically you know, Hudson Bay Post, RCMP Post, old uh, Catholic Mission, old Anglican Mission. They also had in the uh, surrounding areas, they had um, the uh, sort of semi-subterranean Thule houses. So there would be round uh, pits in the ground that the Thule's had used. And they were the sort of precursors to the, uh, the Inuit in the area. Um, so I, I went up there on and off for a year. Uh, totally uh, fascinating experience. You, you had to be accepted by the community to go in there. So had to meet with the Hamlet Council, uh, get their approval. Uh, totally 100% Inuit uh, community. Uh, and I would say they worked hard at trying to maintain their traditions. They had watched what had happened with a lot of the Indian groups in southern Canada particularly with alcohol. So they were a uh, completely dry community by choice and uh, I think a very effective thing to do. Um, anyway, got their approval to work in the uh, community and went with uh, local people out onto the land to see the, the, the various uh, historic resources and uh, met on a fairly regular basis with this uh, community council. And they conducted their meetings in Inuktitut, which I definitely didn't speak. And if you hear the language, there's no, you wouldn't have any sense of what was being discussed. And uh, I remember the final meeting, I'd uh, completed the report. It had been uh, translated into Inuktitut. And uh, I was up there again to do the, the final presentation to their council. And I was really interested in their uh, decision-making process, like they, they do use the consensus process to, to make a, a decision, which isn't quite the way we view consensus, but they do work around till they, they've got the support of, of everybody in, in the room. So anyway, we're at the meeting, and there was one fellow who did some translating for me, and it was a long meeting, and they, they, uh, they would speak in an order, but it wasn't an order of the way you sat. I think it might be, you know, by age, I'm not quite sure. Anyway, everybody spoke. And uh, then the meeting was over. 
So I uh, left the meeting, and the translator said to me, wow, that was amazing. And I had to say, well, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, they loved it. So <laughs> but it, it was quite interesting, just the, um, you know, the body language that we would normally uh, read or uh, facial expressions, it, 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 their culture is not the, you know, I just didn't see it. So um, it was nice to know that they uh, had liked the report. And the, the uh, final conclusion was, no, uh, this is not going to be a tourism center. I mean, it's a, it's a really small town, very basic amenities. Um, and it costs, like Baker Lake is you know, 1,400, 1,600 kilometers north of uh, Winnipeg, and it cost at that time about $1,400 to go one way by plane. And uh, there was just one little hotel and a Nissan hut. But um, the community didn't really know a lot about their, their own history. They were people who had uh, come from somewhere else. So they were the caribou people who had been out on the land. And during the 40s and 50s, when the caribou didn't come, they had, uh, by choice, relocated to, maybe the choice wasn't which place, but they had relocated to, uh, to Baker Lake. So it was the only inland community, and I think it still is, in uh, Nunavut, and the only group of peoples that uh, weren't dependent on uh, ocean animals, seals and whales, so they were dependent on, on caribou. Um, so very uh, interesting uh, group to, to work with. And the, um, the information I had given them uh, from the study, they were able to use. So they ended up uh, building sort of a, an interpretive trail around the community that they used with their school groups. And they, they, they now had some of the historical information as to what these, these things were, former caches and burial sites, et cetera. So um, yeah, I felt that it was a, a worthwhile project, both from, from my perspective and, and theirs. And a, a total eye-opener in terms of, I'd been to every province and every territory, but uh, Baker Lake is the geographic center of the country, and you sort of don't realize how much space is up there until, until you're up there. So. Yeah. Yeah, um, good. No, no, that sounds like a, a wonderful uh, experience. Uh, you, but you were based out of Calgary yeah, at the so time. Yeah, so I'd moved to uh, Calgary and was sort of on loan from Parts Canada to the territorial government for that right. year. Right. Yeah. Then I right. came back to uh, doing planning for Mountain Park planning in the uh, Calgary office, and then um, got on this sort of management uh, trainee program and went, came to Banff in 1986. And um, so we, we moved to Banff and we had just adopted a, a baby boy who is here, now 34. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I took the job as uh, assistant superintendent and Dave Day was the uh, superintendent then. Uh, so Jim Vollmershausen had just left for those who know him or knew him and uh, Dave was then the, the superintendent. And uh, at that point, the assistant superintendent was sort of a, an operational manager. So you had the visitor services, uh, warden service uh, and um, interpretive services uh, reporting to you. And then, in my mind, the superintendent got to do all the stuff that I had no interest in. Media stuff, uh, political stuff, dealing with controversial issues, and I was quite happy to be doing the, the operational side of thing, things. And at that point, I really knew uh, that that's what suited me. Being second in command was where I should be. You know, I, uh, I liked being the second in command and not uh, taking the heat but things changed over time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they did. Yeah. And you, yeah. you were in Banff, and uh, you took up riding, mm -hmm. and of course you were already hiking a lot, and Emil Jurassic yeah. became a great friend. Yeah, so I, I knew I was going to Banff, and I thought I really need to downhill ski because I was going to be dealing with the ski areas, and uh, horses are used a lot in the warden service, and that's how you get around, so I thought, okay, I better learn how to ride horses, although I'm afraid of horses and still continue to be afraid of horses. But uh, I did do a lot of riding. 
And um, Don Sears was the head of visitor services at the time, and Emil Jurassic, uh, who I think is still in Banff, uh, worked for him and was uh, in charge of the Backcountry Trail program. And they both you know, encouraged me to get out and really see the land that I was going to be responsible for. Like, you can't make decisions out of stuff you haven't seen or, or understand. So um, that first year, I was out in the backcountry for 11 overnight trips. So I was very pleased with myself for uh, chiseling out that time in that first year to get out. And uh, I think it really paid off throughout my, my whole career because I really did feel that I, I knew Banff, both the front country and the back country. Um, so while I was acting, um, it was that whole period of negotiating for uh, incorporation of the town of Banff. So up to then, um, the town of Banff was operated by Parts Canada. There, the, there's no, uh, there was no legislation that would allow you to run a municipality within a national park. Municipalities are supposed to be provincial responsibilities. So we had this contorted arrangement that a school board would be elected in Banff and would kind of act as the municipal council, but the superintendent was really the mayor. It was quite awkward. And as the town kept on growing and growing, it really didn't function very well. And Parks Canada recognized that and knew that we were never going to invest the, the time and money that was needed to run this significant town. So there was a process to uh, have a plebiscite and to, as to whether the, the community wanted to become independent, and also uh, to look at all the legislation, both federal and provincial, and to figure out which, which legislation would apply in this town in, in a national park. And that was a, took a lot of work. So Dave Day um, was put on, the superintendent who I reported to, was put on assignment for a year to work on that and to work with the various interests and develop the incorporation agreement. So Banff was uh, incorporated in uh, January, I think, 1990. And uh, so during that year, I acted as superintendent. And having told you I was better as second in command, I, I, uh, I mean, I did it. I didn't hate it, but I, uh, I just didn't like the controversy. I didn't, uh, the, the media coverage uh, you know, which I got used to many years later, but I, uh, I used to be quite pissed off, you know, with the, the, <laughs> the things that were said and the way I was quoted, things that I had never said, and I just uh, was uncomfortable with that stuff. So, uh, yeah, I, uh, that was my first long stint acting as uh, superintendent. Then, um, 1990, I was moved back to the Calgary office. So... Uh, I took various positions, director of communications, director of resource management, uh, strategic planning, business planning. Um, and there are no good stories because it wasn't that much fun. <laughs> 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 and um, so I'd been on this management track and uh, I'm not bilingual and I was uh, supposed to, to uh, go to Ottawa, have a position in Ottawa for a while become bilingual. And my husband and I just thought, we're going to get to Ottawa. Uh, I'm going to do you know, three years in Ottawa. I want to get out of there. And by then, he's going to have a job that he really likes. And, but we wanted to be out west. So we thought, I, I just pulled myself out of the, uh, the management sort of advanced, advancing program. And uh, the position of assistant superintendent became vacant in Banff again. And uh, I asked to transfer back to, to Banff. So I came back to Banff as assistant superintendent. And uh, Charlie Zinken was superintendent then. And I think a lot of you will remember Charlie. Uh, wonderful guy. I loved uh, working with him. And, and we've maintained our, our friendship uh, since then. And, and I worked for him uh, probably directly for more than uh, 10 years in various capacities. So I was um, assistant superintendent. Um, and then they changed the name to associate superintendent. Um, one of the first things uh, I was involved with was the twinning of the Trans-Canada Highway. So a lot of it had been twinned already, but uh, we were looking at uh, phase 3A, which was from Sunshine 
the Sunshine intersection out to the Castle Junction interchange. And uh, I just got involved at the very end. There were various uh, sort of subgroups. There was a, an environmental group. There was um, an, en an engineering uh, group. Uh, they did various uh, public groups involved as well. And I chaired the sort of last meeting, uh, making the final decisions on the highway. And uh, one of the issues had been uh, wildlife crossing structures. So the first phases had had the wildlife crossing structures, so the, the underpasses uh, under the, uh, the four lanes. And uh, people were becoming um, more interested in looking at overpasses for wildlife. So the biologists felt you know, it's quite likely that they would be more effective than the underpasses, but there were no guarantees. And if you've ever been in the underpasses, like a lot of them are, they're concrete box culverts, they're quite noisy, or they're, they're metal culverts, like there's nothing natural about those, <laughs> those underpasses. So um, a lot of groups have been asking for the uh, wildlife overpasses, but they were uh, way more expensive than the underpasses. And uh, so the feeling was, no, uh, it couldn't be afforded. And then at the last minute, Terry McGuire, who was the transportation engineer, had uh, come across um, a company that made these, uh, I think they were concrete uh, structures that, that could be used and sort of put in place, tied in together, that would be significantly cheaper than actually sort of building a, an overpass bridge. So we, we came to the end of the meeting. So are we going to spend this more money or not? And I, that was sort of the first time I thought, Oh shit, I'm the decision maker here. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I just thought, if Pars Canada isn't going to take the chance and build these overpasses, who is? Like, there's no other organization that could uh, you know, justify the, the extra expense. So uh, we, yes, we made the decision to do the, uh, the overpasses, uh, which have been a huge success. And I think it took quite a while for the public to, to realize how successful they they were because they were expecting to see animals walking on top of them, <laughs> which uh, you don't see because there's a big dip in the middle, which is the whole idea. They're not supposed to know they're walking over top of a, of a highway. So, uh, and um, Parks Canada with Tony Clevenger put a lot of money into monitoring the effectiveness of the overpasses because then the, the question was, are we, are we going to build more of them on the next sections? And again, expensive things to, to build and also to know that the design of them was, was effective. And um, so, yes, uh, wildlife use them, particularly the bigger uh, wildlife are particularly attracted to those. Uh, but all different species have used them, and Tony did some work to see is it, uh, you know, a few single um, members of a particular species that are using it, or is it, it uh, wide, widely used? And they are widely used. and. Um, it's a problem that all over the world we have because of uh, transportation corridors and animals not being able to get across. So um, there's been a lot of interest from uh, other countries. And I know that uh, Terry, the transportation engineer, um, got invited to go to India and look at uh, movement of elephants across canals and, and highways. Wow. So uh, yeah, it was wow. interesting. So yeah. that's a, a real success yeah. story. Yeah. Yeah. Real success story. Yeah. And uh, so where are we now? We're okay. we're we're yeah. going to Japan next. Oh, we're going to Japan. Okay. So um, during one of the uh, the times when I was uh, acting uh, superintendent, this um, fellow, Japanese fellow came to uh, to visit me in the office, and I found out he was the uh, superintendent of Daisetsuzen National Park, which is the oldest national park in Japan, and it's on the island of Hokkaido in, in the north. A, a mountain, it has a, a mountainous park. And uh, he wondered if I would come to the park um, to speak at a conference. And uh, they would pay my way. And I, I was delighted. I'd never been to Japan. And I mean, Japan would not be high on my list of uh, places that I would want to go. but. It's still an interesting place to go. So um, we communicated uh, back and forth. And 
they decided that they wanted more than one person from Parts Canada to come. They were willing to pay for four, which I just couldn't, uh, couldn't justify. But Rob Harding helped me put the, the presentation together, so Rob came with me. And at the last minute, uh, uh, my husband and, and son, we decided that they would come as well. And uh, what I discovered was they wanted me to do a half-hour presentation in English and Japanese. <laughs> so uh, I would do the English, and uh, then somebody would uh, translate it into Japanese. So we got it translated ahead of time, and uh, then a woman uh, read it. But um, I was just amazed that for half an hour that they would have me come there. But you know, it was interesting. So we arrived in the, uh, the park, and we're immediately met by, I think there were about eight guys in, uh, in suits, and they ushered me into this, uh, with Rob, into this room. And they wanted us to run through the presentation because they had to know what we were going to say, although they'd had the translation. But they had to know it was no longer than 30 minutes and no shorter than 30 minutes. Like, they were very specific. So we had slides at the time, so we put up the first slide, which was of Banff, and then uh, we decided we'd introduce ourselves and get our titles translated so that they would know who we were. So a second slide came up, and we had our names and our titles. And uh, then there was all this discussion in, uh, in the room and debate in, in Japanese. We didn't know what was going on. Then they told me that there'd been a grave error in the translation, that it said I was acting as the superintendent. And that was a real, you know, I was not the real superintendent. And uh, so I was about to explain that I was the acting superintendent, and then I realized, oh, they think they have invited the real superintendent. <laughs> and they're very status conscious, so I thought, okay, why don't we just take that slide out? So, <laughs> so we got, uh, got rid of that slide. Uh, another totally uh, interesting experience, um, totally different uh, culture. Um, uh, one of the other things I found particularly interesting, they didn't know um, what to do with a woman in a, a really responsible position. They, they, there, they do have women in responsible positions, but you're not married and you definitely don't have kids. So uh, they didn't know what to do with my husband and son. So I think if it had been the other way around and Miles had been the important person, uh, I would have been just left on my own. But uh, they escorted Miles around and Jonathan around and showed them all sorts of things while I was doing my, my uh, work with them. Um, so that was uh, both interesting cultural experience as well. Right, right. Then um, moving into, that was in 94. Then the years of 95 and 96, uh, as many of you know, weren't good years uh, for me. The, the, uh, my position as assistant superintendent got vaporized. They uh, decided don't have assistant superintendents anymore. And I was given this other job that hadn't really uh, been de defined, which was uh, ecosystem secretariat manager. Um, and then in 96, uh, my husband died uh, very suddenly from uh, a heart attack. He was 47. Uh, Jonathan, where are you, Jonathan? Okay. <laughs> Jonathan was 10. Um, I, uh, my husband, I did know he had a, had a heart issue. And, uh, you know, you have this expectation that I'll probably outlive him, but I, I never for one minute thought of being a a single parent of a young child, somebody dying at 47. Yeah. I was not prepared at all. So it, it was extremely uh, difficult. And I have always been very glad that I was in the Bow Valley when that happened, because I can't imagine going through that in a, a big city. And uh, I was involved in, the, Miles and I were both involved in the United Church at the time. They rallied and really supported us. Um, Miles, at that time, uh, he'd gotten a job as the director of planning for the town of Canmore. So both the town of Canmore and uh, Banff were involved in providing support, and I'm forever thankful for that. So after Miles died, I took, uh, I, I call it my uh, downwardly mobile career path. I, I just uh, couldn't deal with being assistant superintendent at the time or this ecosystem secretary manager. 
Um, I took uh, two summers off so I could spend them with uh, Jonathan. And we had a little cabin in uh, BC that we would go to. Um, and then eventually in this career path, I became planner again for, uh, for BAMP. So I did that for a while. And then eventually moved into being uh, in a position called um, Senior Policy Advisor for the Mountain Park. So there was an office, and Charlie Zinkin was the, the head of it, which um, looked after the, the mountain parks and the, uh, the issues that uh, affected all the parks, not just individual parks. Uh, so it was Banff, Jasper, Kootenai, Yoho, Waterton, and Revelstoke and Glacier as well. And uh, so I got involved in the overarching things. Um, and one of the first things I got involved in uh, was the, the sort of the tail end of the, the Banff Bow Valley study. And um, that had been started in, what did I say? 94. 94. Uh, and it was response to the, uh, you know, the ongoing issues of uh, preservation, development. Uh, it didn't matter what you decided, it was wrong. And, and just a lot of uh, controversy and people not really happy with what was going on. Particularly in, in the Bow Valley, which you know, was the pressure for uh, roads, railways, communities. Uh, town of Camor. Uh, was turning into a major, you know, starting to be a major uh, tourism destination. Calgary was growing more day visitors. So the, uh, the Bow Valley study was set up. It had a task force, uh, primarily made up of people outside Parks Canada. And it was uh, headed by Bob Page, who was at University of Calgary at the time. And uh, they set up a, um, a sort of novel uh, round table uh, system for a consultation would bring uh, representatives of groups together for two days at a, at a time and really get, get into an issue and, and hammer things out. And um, eventually uh, finished their report. They had over 500 recommendations in it. And uh, I mean, Parks Canada spent a lot of money on, on the study and, and wanted it to be the, the solution to a lot of issues. So we wanted to. Uh, really publicly demonstrate we were taking this seriously. Uh, and so we, we decided that uh, we would have the minister physically accept the report and also indicate a few of the, the major recommendations that were going to be implemented, you know, make a commitment right then and there to implement them. So our minister at the time was Sheila Copps. And uh, most of you will remember her. And, uh, yeah. So Charlie had to, uh, he, he, we wrote a whole bunch of briefing notes uh, and it was Charlie's responsibility to brief her. So he flew to Ottawa to brief her, wasn't able to see her, she canceled her appointment. So then he got put on the uh, private jet, the government jet that she was flying in back to Calgary and he had to sit at the back and sort of as the plane's landing he sort of called forward to, uh, to brief her a bit. She didn't like civil servants, but I didn't mind because she didn't really like anybody very much. So <laughs> was my conclusion. So, but uh, yeah, so he had very little time to brief her. We were quite worried. Um, we may have even been in this building when the, uh, she accepted the report and then uh, fed back what, what we were going to do. Um, she was brilliant. She was totally, I don't know, somehow she absorbed all the information. There were lots of questions. She answered them really well, really accurately. So I was kind of impressed with her. But then I had some more dealings with her. So, <laughs> so the, uh, I don't know if it was that time when she was out, but um, she didn't like our signs at the gate. So if you remember at the gates, we had these lovely stone signs and then a carved uh, wild animal in them, and then the, the park name. And she felt it did not demonstrate that this was a, it was federal government, federal government money. So uh, we were required to put up the normal federal government sign, and I always say it's the same one at the federal penitentiary. It's exactly the same sign, it's just got different <laughs> words at it. And I remember the day that uh, we had to plow that, uh, the old sign down and the number of phone calls we got saying, what are you doing? 
So anyway, we changed the sign for Banff. I don't know if we, it was done anywhere else, but we knew we had to do it for Banff. Then the other thing that uh, happened, we had our uh, government vehicles. We had a hodgepodge of uh, the old parts Canada brown vehicles. And then you couldn't buy brown vehicles anymore, so we switched to white because that was the only sort of color that you knew you could, could get for a while. And um, Sheila Copps wanted us to have red vehicles. But if you bought a red vehicle, like there's 20 different reds, it just wouldn't work. So she insisted that they be the Pantone color of red that's in the flag, so the exact red, which meant we had to paint, go out and custom paint every vehicle. <laughs> and uh, we just couldn't bring ourselves to do it. I mean, it, one, it's a cost. <coughs> Two, environmentally, it's just irresponsible. But anyway, uh, so we didn't do it. And then she came out to see us again. <laughs> and uh, Charlie was in a lot of trouble. <laughs> so we finally decided, OK, we're going to get some cars painted red. And when she comes back again, we'll move things around in the parking lot. So she. <laughs> She sees the red vehicle, so that's how we, uh, we dealt with it. So, uh, yeah, I think Parks Canada now has white vehicles so that solves that problem. Yeah. 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 And then. Uh, so, the, um, yeah. Yeah, following the Bow Valley study, um, I was asked to take the, the study that had all these recommendations and turn it into a, a, a park management plan, which is what guides. Um, land use in, in every national park. And um, we'd set up an advisory, a small advisory group uh, to work with, and it included the uh, CEO of Parts Canada, Tom Lee. And we worked through all the recommendations, and I was sort of feeding the, the information to these people and trying to consolidate things. So we did that over a number of months, and then um, I spent actually that Christmas uh, holiday, uh, Jonathan and I were at our cottage, and uh, I wrote the park management plan. And uh, it actually was, it was a good thing to be, you know, for me to be, uh, you know, really focused on. That was our first Christmas without uh, Miles, and Jonathan was a teenager. He slept most of the time, so I, <laughs> <laughs> I wrote the, uh, I wrote the, uh, the management plan, and I think it was, well, it was uh, well accepted at the time. And uh, it was very significant. I think. Yeah, but, yeah, and I think it was a significant shift for uh, for the park. Can you give us a bit of an idea of what was special? Of what well, was it different? was the um, <clears throat> you know defining of the boundaries for the the town of Banff, the capping of the uh, commercial uh, square footage uh, for Banff, and, and we subsequently bought some properties on on Banff Avenue uh, to to try and get rid of some of the commercial uh, square footage. Um, certainly focused on um, maintaining a healthy ecosystem and uh, looking at grizzly bear populations really as the um, you know, significant uh, symbol or indicator of, of health of the, uh, the ecosystem. And I, and I worked a lot on uh, gr the grizzly bear issue with, with my job. Um, I don't think you want any more about the Bow Valley study. No, that's enough. <laughs> it's very interesting. Yeah, I remember it well, yeah, just from yeah, a distance. Yeah, it no, just it, overwhelmed the whole yeah, valley. Yeah, and it was very significant in the, the way it involved people and the way that Parks Canada stepped back and uh, tried to have it. This is somebody else is going to advise us. That was yeah. definitely a new approach. Yeah, yeah. 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 And it, it gave a whole new direction for yeah, Parks. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, which yeah. is very important. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. So as um, senior policy advisor for the Mountain Parks, one of the things I, I got involved with um, close to my, the end of my time in that job was uh, Parks Canada's response to the uh, avalanche accidents in uh, Glacier National Park with the um, Strathcona Tweedsmuir School and seven of their uh, high school students uh, being killed in an avalanche. And uh, that was a big shift for Parks Canada too, um, we were the landlords, so we looked at, well, you know, parks are open for use. It's really, you know, the schools that should be 
uh, setting up the, the rules for these outdoor education uh, groups and, and who should be leading them. Uh, one of the issues was that um, Parks Canada provided avalanche uh, danger information, but we actually had more information than we provided to the general public, and it was just sort of viewed as uh, too technical and complicated and not bilingual uh, to provide to the general public that it would be overwhelming. Um, so we had a um, consulting company that does uh, risk assessments uh, came in and uh, had a contract with us. And the conclusion was, no, as a landowner, you have a responsibility. And particularly to uh, what are called custodial groups, so groups that are um, young people uh, for which adults are, are responsi responsible. And so there were some new rules with respect to custodial groups. Uh, but it was also the start of a, a much stronger approach to uh, avalanche awareness and making people aware of, of what the, uh, the hazards were and being more uh, explicit. So we, um, we realized we needed somebody internally to uh, get us through the, the whole thing. And that's when we hired Grant Statham, who uh, was, ex in my mind, exactly the right person for for that job. He's been uh, very creative, um, very good at working with uh, other groups in terms of uh, looking at different ways of assessing avalanche hazard and also ways of communicating it, the whole uh, avalanche training programs that are, that are now in place. A and uh, yeah, the assessment of the, the landscape in terms of uh, avalanche hazard. And um, one of the things that was decided early on was that uh, complex landscapes which are difficult to um, interpret when you are in avalanche hazard or not. Um, if it's complex terrain, you can't take a custodial group, period. And they, they have to have a, a license guide anyway, but with custodial groups, no, you can't even go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So oh. a, a, uh, a very <clears throat> sad occasion, but I think it really took Parks Canada and, and other organizations further ahead in the whole avalanche thing. Yeah. So then we get to oh, you became... my, mo my moving into almost being superintendent. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> I, um, um, prior to the summer of 2003, I, I can't remember why there wasn't a superintendent, but anyway, there wasn't. And uh, Charlie had, uh, he asked me, would I be acting superintendent for the summer? And I just know how short our summers are, and I like my hiking. And I thought, not again. <laughs> so I said, no, I really don't want to do it. So uh, he said, well, it might make a difference to your pension. I thought, hmm, yes, it might. <laughs> and, uh, and there's nobody else to do it. So I said, OK, I'll do it. And uh, so the first thing I did in the summer, I had a trip already planned with a, a bunch of my women friends. We went. Uh, hiking in the Nayuts in the, on the BC coastal area. Um, there, fires had started in BC, but we were kind of oblivious to it. We didn't have smoke. It was you know sunny, warm weather, really nice hiking. Then we were driving back to Banff, and it was very smoky, and we started realizing, wow, this is uh, bad. And it, it was a very bad summer, 2003, if you remember, for, for wildfires all through BC. That was the... The summer that Kelowna, a number of houses, uh, housing area in Kelowna burnt. And so we had a really big fire in Kootenay, started by lightning, a, a number of lightning strikes. They were started as different fires and became one, one fire. And so um, it went on for more than a month. And uh, most mornings, I would go down to the incident command area in Kootenay with uh, the Kootenay superintendent and Charlie, who was still head of the mountain parks. And uh, work, you know, the incident team would tell us what the issues were and, and what was happening with the, the fire. And it went on and on. And um, finally, it, the uh, suggestion came, OK, we can, we'd had no rain for like 40 plus days. Um, and there, there was a decision that needed to make, be made. Do we just you know, babysit the, the fire? and wait till the rain puts it out? Um, or do we do something so that uh, places like Kootenay Park Lodge and Storm Mountain Lodge don't, uh, aren't in, in jeopardy? 
And so the, uh, the fire crew, fire group put forward the proposal of uh, building a fire break uh, south of Storm Mountain Lodge. And I think you've, you've seen the, the scar that's there. It's a really good ski area. <laughs> <laughs> it's in my guidebook. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the uh, D9s went up uh, both sides and uh, took off all of the organic material. Um, the whole area was just uh, waterlogged. We got these irrigation pipes from Saskatchewan. And uh, then uh, we lit a fire and burnt up to that fire break. So that was the, the decision because it's one thing uh, burning down a facility and a person's livelihood because you can't defend it from a wildfire. But I mean, the liability is quite different when it's something, it's a fire that you've started. So that was uh, you know, a, a big decision to make. And I, I do have to say that I think Parts Canada was at the forefront of the whole thing of fire management and prescribed burns and Cliff White of the White Family White Museum. Uh, very instrumental in that a really uh, forward uh, thinker in the whole thing of fire management. And I would like to say that Jane Park, um, a woman, is in that position now and is doing a very good job in, uh, in Banff. Right. Um, <clears throat> so we, uh, it was successful and the, the fuel load was reduced and the fire went out. So that was, uh, Good result. Um, so that ended late summer. The uh, fire issue. Oh, I, oh, yeah, my little oh, story. You're, you're, I can't forget my oh, little story. Oh, you can't yeah. forget well, I, that one. I have a number of stories about that whole period, but uh, there's one story I love. I um, I was going down to the to get in a helicopter to take a, a tour of the fire to see what had happened. And uh, the helicopter base was where the, the road turns in, in Kootenai. And uh, by the, Sim the Simpson River, and there was, yeah, they had you know, big helicopters sitting there. So I, uh, it was a hot day. I was in uh, shorts and sandals, apparently. And um, <laughs> you had to remind me of this, Kathy. I had, the day before, I had had the only pedicure I've ever had in my life. And, uh, <laughs> I, uh, somebody had given me this pedicure at the Banff Springs, so I had these nice red toenails. So I was, I was standing there waiting for, for something to happen, and this guy came up to me and started chatting, and he said, oh, I really like your, your toes. You know, I've been fighting fires for two months. I haven't seen sexy toes like that for quite a while. <laughs> so we were, we were chatting, and then uh, finally I said, oh, well, what are you doing here? And he said, Oh, I'm the helicopter pilot. We're waiting for some big poobah from Bath to come. <laughs> <laughs> so then, then he said, uh, and what are you doing here? I said, I think I'm your big poobah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wonderful. Uh, oh. He, uh, he didn't speak to me again. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Oh, gee. Yeah, that was, no. Uh, oh, that gee. Was been, yeah. Okay, what a great story. Yeah. Yeah, just looking at okay, what we so up then, to the next. Um, I was still acting superintendent. Then in October, they posted the position for superintendent, and I knew I wasn't interested. Uh, but they, uh, they posted it so that only a certain classification could apply, and I was not in that classification group. So I just went in and said to Charlie, you know, I am not interested, but... You know, you guys wonder why there are never, like, there's always complaining, like, why won't women take these senior positions in the field? He said, there isn't a single woman who could apply for it. Um, there would be people in Ottawa with no park, you know, field experience. Um, and Charlie said, oh, yeah, you're right, I'll see what I can do. So then, a couple of weeks later, he said, well, we've changed it. Anybody who's interested can apply. So then I went home, and uh, I thought, I'm actually starting to like this job. <laughs> and uh, uh, talked to Jim, who subsequently became my husband and my son, and said, well, what do you think? And they were supportive. So um, I applied for it. And then I, I started thinking, I'm going to be really annoyed if I don't get this or really <laughs> upset. Um, and, and anyway, I, I did get it in November. So then I became the real superintendent. And that yeah. was the, uh, the first woman who had been you know, got into that position through a, a competitive process. So I was 
was pleased with that, and I actually uh, did enjoy the job. And I think a lot of it was just, uh, you know, maturity, and uh, I knew the media write whatever they want to write. It sort of wasn't as personalized anymore. And I also uh, knew the players. You know, I knew the people in the community. I knew, knew the interest groups and, and that sort of thing. So uh, most of the job I enjoyed, although when I think back, I was trying to think of things to talk about. I mean, spent 90% of every day in uh, meetings, after meeting, after meeting on everything. Yeah. Um, but one, and one of the, the uh, sort of more frustrating things was working with the, the ski hills. Uh, I am a downhill skier. I've probably had a season's pass at one of the ski hills for more than 20 years. Um, so I know downhill skiing. Um, but trying to negotiate uh, long-range plans for ski areas was pretty uh, tough. And I worked mainly with uh, Sunshine and Norquay and less so with Louise. But I must say I enjoyed working with uh, Charlie Locke. We didn't agree. But he, he was, uh, I mean, he was open and honest, and I enjoyed working with him. And I found Sunshine just very difficult. So uh, you, you probably remember in the, uh, I think it was last year, they had, uh, I think it was a draft plan put out, and uh, Ralph Skirfield, the owner, was complaining that uh, Parts Canada was willing to negotiate with all the other ski areas, but never negotiated with Sunshine, and I don't know how many hours, you know, at least four superintendents had spent trying to negotiate things with, uh, with Sunshine. So that was always a disappointment that we never got anywhere on that one. I also worked on the Siksika specific land claim at uh, Castle Junction, uh, which didn't get resolved when I was around, but uh, that was interesting. Uh, and I did enjoy uh, working with the, uh, the scientists and the public on the whole issue of uh, managing to sustain grizzly bears on the, the landscape. Um, and we were looking, you know, looking at how you manage the, the backcountry, uh, identifying you know, habitat patches and uh, wildlife uh, corridors, and then uh, working with various stakeholders to discuss, well, what can we do about it to try and uh, ensure that uh, grizzly bears do stay on the, the landscape. And I think it's been fairly successful. I mean, it, it's... Uh, it's not good habitat for grizzly bears anyway. They would have been normally more in the foothills and on the, the prairies. Uh, but the population, I think, is fairly stable still in, in the parks. And the big issue uh, is the railway. Yeah. And uh, now the highway issue has been pretty, not completely solved, but, but fairly well solved. But the, the railway is still an issue. And in doing that work, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so I worked with uh, Mike Jibo on uh, most of that. He was the, uh, the grizzly bear expert. And uh, Steve Herrero, who was at uh, University of Calgary. And, and then with a lot of uh, interest groups. Um, so after about four and a half years of being superintendent, um, I thought I'd had enough. And, uh, but I did stick it out for, for five years. In the, in the end. And, uh, but the final thing that just made me think, I got to get out of here, uh, was, a, I suppose, a minor issue, but it just was uh, typical of the stuff I had to deal with. Ottawa was getting more and more involved in those are what I would call day-to-day -day operations of the park. And we had uh, a highway sign on the trans Canada highway. highway had been run over, needed to be replaced. And Parks Canada was busy writing a national sign plan in Ottawa. And uh, so the, the highway people weren't able to get approval to build this, to replace the sign. So I phoned the person in Ottawa who was writing this sign plan. And uh, he said, well, the sign plan's not done, so you can't put up a sign. And uh, so you couldn't build an old sign, but the new design hadn't been approved yet. And then he said, and on top of that, when we get the new design, you have to replace all signs at once. But they can't be two different signs. Well, in a place like that, like that's millions and millions and millions of dollars with all the highways. Um, and I remember at the end of the conversation saying, what classification are you? <laughs> <laughs> 
And then I thought, you know, Jillian, I think maybe it's time to move on. <laughs> oh, gee. So I have moved on. Uh, I retired in 2008. Um, I've taken up um, fabric design and art. These are, uh, are my pieces. Oh, and I didn't point out to you my girl guide poncho with all my badges on it. Um, so I'm thoroughly enjoying uh, retirement, hiking in the summer, uh, skiing in the winter. Um, I think, yeah. And fabric life is, art? Life is good. Hmm? And, yeah, and, and my, my fabric, fabric art, art. I spend a lot of, uh, of time on and thoroughly enjoy it. And uh, I've done quite a bit of traveling. Jim and I went to uh, Nepal and trekked to um, Everest Base Camp. And then he declared he wasn't that interested in... Uh, travel anymore, so my friend Joan stepped forward, another quilter, and we've traveled to South Africa on various, uh, you know, fabric-related tours, South Africa and Ireland, and um, yeah, life is, life is very good. And, so, and it's a blessing to live here in yeah, the Bow Valley, yes. in this So community. I, I uh, you know, whenever I travel, I come back and I think, this is a very nice place, and I, I love the Bow Valley, and uh, I really believe in... Um, community and belonging to a community. And uh, so I've lived in Banff, I've lived in, in Canmore, and I view the whole Bow, Bow Valley as a community that I'm very thankful to be part of. And thank you for, I don't know, almost everybody in the audience here, so it's kind of, <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of fun. Yeah. And thank you, Jillian, <laughs> thank for you. this yeah. evening and for being such a special person. Okay.